Right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to uh, restart. I hope you're enormously refreshed by your uh, coffee break, courtesy of Elsevier. So I'd like to thank the sponsor for that. Um, right, we now have two uh, interesting presentations for you. So uh, this is really on the theme of library library based publishing and um, two kind of interesting uh, uh, different ca cases on takes on this. Uh, we have Maria Bond from the uh, University of Illinois talking about some research into uh, uh, that area. And then we get Lucy Lamb from LSE where they've uh, uh, conducted a project to look at uh, creating a, an LSE university press. Uh, again, their biographies are in the program, so I'm not going to uh, go through all of that. Um, but I'm simply just going to hand over straight away to Maria Bond. Thank you. Good afternoon, or no, it's still morning? Just still morning. Um, I'm Maria, and I'm here today to talk about publishing without walls. And a question I think all of us in scholarly publishing and in libraries as well are often asking, what do they want anyway? Um, an attempt to understand the needs of scholars in a contemporary publishing environment. Uh, publishing Without Walls is a library-based digital publishing initiative from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, the project is funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Uh, we're located in the university library, partnering with the School of Information Sciences, which is my home base, the Illinois Program for Research in the Humanities, and the Department of African American Studies. Four-year project, and we're into year three at this point. I'm talking today about one piece of this large project, the research piece. Uh, but first, I want to do a little bit of professional and um, disciplinary location. Uh, because of the interests of our funders and an area in which we saw some unmet need, we're particularly focused on the publishing needs of humanity scholars. And that's what I'll be talking about today. And I also want to say that um, we are, uh, when we talk about digital publishing, we tend to scope that with our research subjects as publishing that is designed to take advantage of the communicative and representational affordances of the web, uh, not just a, a replication of essentially print on screen, uh, but publishing that is intended to exploit digital affordances. There we go. So within the broader publishing ecosystem, our focus is on supporting open access scholarship and experimental forms of scholarly communication. We contend that in a rapidly evolving digital publishing landscape, academic libraries are well poised to address pu scholars' publishing concerns about gaining access to opportunities for publishing support and, and reskilling about providing open access to intellectual content, and ensuring access to the audiences who will most benefit from their work. Um, our primary objectives focus on building capacity, both our own as publishers and our scholars, uh, doing development in alignment with scholars' expressed needs, and exploring new models for scholarly communication. So these objectives are designed to ensure that development activities are informed by and proceed apace with scholars' current practices, perceived needs, and publication activities. The scholars' needs are the driving force of all our development activities. And this is where I come in. I lead the research piece, the one I've put in red up here. Um, and I have a, a shady past as a publisher myself, and returning to the classroom and to being a researcher, I'm having a wonderful opportunity to try to answer some of the questions I probably should have asked on my first day on the job, uh, but now I get to do so in a, in a formal way. Uh, so we begin with the pre premise that we're living in a time of proliferation of publishing choices. How to publish, where to publish, 
what platforms to use, what values inform the publication. And this is largely because of the rapid development of digital technology, of networked communication, and because business and service providers have responded to that development uh, by providing new choices in publishing. So what's a poor scholar to do? How do they, how do they navigate these choices? Well, in offering us some guidance through this labyrinth of choices, uh, we begin with the premise that the goals of the scholars will inform their choices. So in all our conversations, we ask the scholars to be as clear as possible on their goals. Um, and these are some of the things we've heard or speculated, uh, many of which will be familiar, others which may seem more implausible. Um, I think we can all agree upon the fact that any of us publish to impress our mothers, at least in an attempt. Um, other, than that, other than that, we hear a, a wide range of reasons. I want to get promoted. I want tenure. I want to get my work out there. I'd really like somebody to work, work with my material and edit it and make it more professional. Uh, one uh, scholar said to me, uh, I love my publisher. She keeps me from embarrassing myself. Uh, I've done cleanup and editing and those kinds of things. Uh, so given this wide range of goals, what's the best way to go about your publishing? So the research piece of publishing without walls is trying to understand these kinds of questions. How do you publish now? How would you like to publish? What sort of tools do you want to use? And what are your requirements for those tools? What kind of support do you think you need going about your publication? Um, and we're exploring these through a fairly standard set of qualitative methods, uh, through interviews, th uh, conducting focus groups, and conducting surveys. Uh, so being good information scientists, we began with a survey. In 2016, we conducted a nationally scoped survey designed to establish a general baseline understanding of scholars' digital publishing needs. The survey consisted of 30 questions covering six themes that included prior experience with print and digital publishing, interest in tools and services for digital publishing, and soliciting, soliciting feedback from scholars as consumers of digital publications. Today's talk focuses on select findings regarding scholars' perceived challenges, prioritized goals, and target audiences for their work. The survey ran May through October 2016 and received 250 responses. Uh, we recruited using a purposive sampling method through listservs, social media venues, targeting scholars in the humanities generally, as well as some more targeted disciplinary communities as we went along to encourage sufficient responses across institutions, disciplines, and professional rank. Uh, just to put the responses in context, the majority of the respondents who supplied optional demographics are tenure-line faculty, and of those, the majority were already tenured. And despite our targeted efforts, disciplinary representation skews toward English literature and librarian information science. We wanted to develop a better understanding of scholars' publishing goals and how they prioritized across multiple goals. We provided a list of nine items and asked scholars to rank up to five goals, with one being the highest priority. The top two goals by far, perhaps unsurprisingly, are to contribute new information in the field and to encourage and participate in dialogue about your area of study. We believe these goals are well supported by our publishing, library publishing efforts. Several of the platforms we support include features for fostering dialogue through annotation, through peer review, open peer review, or open review, excuse me. We also hope that library-based publishing is a good fit for scholars who wish, wish to reach the widest possible audience. And the number of scholars who indicated that priority in the survey is non-trivial. We may, however, at this time, 
present a relative disadvantage to those prioritizing professional advancement. We're new and we're still small, for which publication expectations may vary by discipline and department. And of course, for that, that lone scholar who's in it for the money, nothing says get rich quick like doctoral studies in the tenure track. Because audience reach is especially important to us, we wanted to get a feel for scholars intended re readers. These choices were presented as a checklist and scholars could choose as many as applied. Sorry, I'm having advancement issues again. There we go. While, reading while reaching scholars in one's own discipline was the most common response, it's perhaps a bit more interesting to see the strength of interest in reaching across disciplines and outside the academy. And perhaps it's amu a little amusing to see how little interest there is in reaching colleagues at one's own institution. It's that tiny little sliver there at the bottom. Maybe we figure our colleagues know already? Because audience reach is especially important to us, we also wanted to get a feel for scholars intended readers. The choices were presented as a checklist. Scholars could choose as many as applied. And then in order to understand how scholars measure success, at least, or at least have a sense of having met goals, we also probed on a variety of measures and metrics asking them to indicate the degree of importance of these measures. Various indicators of use and of attention are popular. But the runaway favorite is direct communication from other scholars in your discipline. Reinforcing the popularity of the goals of reaching scholars in one own, one's own field that we saw early and of contributing new information to the field. Uh, and we neglected to include praise from your mom. To assess challenges in the publishing process, we gave respondents a list of nine items and asked them to rank each on a five-point Likert scale from not at all challenging to extremely challenging. This chart represents the percentage of respondents who indicated each potential issue as either quite challenging or extremely challenging in print or digital publishing. The top three challenges for digital publishing include getting adequate technical, editorial, and financial support. When comparing scholars' characterization of challenges in digital versus print publishing, speed to publication and reaching one's intended audience emerge as the two greatest challenges to print publication. They're perceived as relatively less challenging in digital formats. This emphasis on support, editorial, technical, financial support, indicates the importance of early intervention in digital publications. To that end, PWW is modeling outreach and publication workflows that provide additional scaffolding. In addition to hands-on workshops, these include technical consultation with the production team to assess requirements and match projects to the most appropriate platform, and prior to entering the formal uh, production pipeline, scholars are given access to a sandbox environment to experiment. We also designed questions to get a sense of the scholarly publishing experience. On a five-point Likert scale from extremely important to not at all important, respondents ranked 10 services. 151 participants ranked at least one item. These responses were coded from one, not at all important, to five, extremely important. Communication and transparency from the publisher in the process was clearly most important, followed closely by peer review coordination. More than half of respondents ranked digital archiving and preservation. 
publisher intervention for representation of content, marketing and audience creation support, support for navigating third-party permissions, and hosting for supplementary digital materials as either four or five, important or extremely important. Responses varied considerably for remaining services across the entire range of options. Once we had a sense of need, we wanted to know if need was being met. After calculating the average satisfaction across responses, more than half of respondents indicated that peer review coordination was either adequately or very adequately supported. Perceived adequacy of support varied considerably across the other categories. A quarter or more of respondents were dissatisfied with the level of support for instruction in working with digital publishing tools, for digital archiving and preservation, for marketing, support for navigation of third party permissions, and just note the, level of satis the low level of satisfaction with the communication and transparency item that was so considered so important when we asked what services mattered. So this is, here's just a, uh, the elevator pitch, uh, a recap of some of the things that we found. Um, print publishing is too slow. Um, digital publishing needs a lot of support. Money doesn't matter much. Sales don't matter. Neither do its institutional colleagues. Reputation and attention in the field matter a whole lot. Scholars want to know what's going on behind the curtain. And uh, this one can come up in my slides, but it's clear in the survey, most people think they're more accepting of change than their peers. I'm ready to change, but the rest of them, this is still an issue. So these re results represent only a small fraction of the overall survey, but we found them informative as we seek to situate library-based digital scholarly publishing within the broader ecosystem. A little less than a year ago, after concluding the survey, we began conducting interviews with scholars, largely in the humanities again, about their publishing goals and experiences, with special attention to their attitudes toward digital publishing and the perceptions of the benefits and challenges of that publishing. To date, we've conducted about 20 interviews. We intend to do several more until mid-2018. We've just begun the formal coding and analysis of the transcripts of those interviews. We find, it will not surprise you to learn, that scholars have quite a bit to say about publishing. We almost always overrun the allocated hour. And the interviews we have done so far provide us with a very rich body of it reported experience, opening a wonderful window into the world of scholarly publishing. It may also not surprise you to learn that feelings are mixed and opinions are not always shared. Go figure. In the interviews, we elaborate on many of the themes of the survey, but we focus the conversations around publishing plans for a project currently underway. And we contextualize that conversation with general inquiries about past publishing experiences. In all our interviews so far, no respondent has cited a particularly successful publishing experience. I don't know if this means that publishers have a lot of work to do in managing author relations, or that there's just no pleasing them, those scholars. I'm not going to read to you this um, uh, bits I've, I've selected out of our interview transcripts so far. Uh, I'll just let you uh, have a look at them as I'm talking. I just want to say that um, shifts in font styling indicate different speakers. Uh, I was very purposeful about not having one voice. Uh, I, there's one person uh, that's repeated in the next few slides, but mostly these come from uh, different interview um, candidates. So we see a lot of enthusiasm uh, for digital publishing in our discussions, for the potential of digital publishing. Maybe not potential yet realized, but what might happen. There's a lot of appetite for innovation, for community building, for broadening audience, and a lot of appetite for uh, presenting evidence and context, and the kind of rich pre presentation of evidence that the uh, publication on the web may make possible. And 
another recurring theme is that in digital publication makes possible an evolving document, one that can be revised and updated quickly, one that can respond to uh, online feedback. Uh, this notion of the living document has come up several times in our interviews. Um, and I think it's interesting that the, although as a community we talk a lot about whether print is dead, uh, what I'm hearing in my conversations is that print is a kind of death. You print it, it's done, it's fixed. You can't go back and keep it alive in, this, in the same kind of continual way. Another theme emerging, and one that I hadn't actually uh, anticipated, but has come up at every interview, is questions about time. Oh, but wait, that first, that first quotation, that's not one of our interview subjects, that's Oldenburg. Uh, this is in the notes, the introductory notes to the first volume of the, philo of the Philosophical Transactions. A lot of people are doing weighty productions which require both time and assistance for their due maturity. Um, I've heard that in paraphrase from almost every um, interview respondent. Time and assistance, time and assistance. Uh, so I can report from my experience that again and again the conversations turn to time. Not enough of it or too much of it passing. Scholars consistently report that there is not enough time to develop the fullest and most effective expression of their work. Once that work is expressed and does go out for publication, it takes far too long to make its way through the process and reach an audience. And increasingly, we're hearing an expression of need for timely support. The 24-7 librarian or 24-7 editor who's there on chat late on Sundays, for instance. Somebody did ask for this. And for all the enthusiasm about the possibilities and the opportunities it affords for representation and impact, we also often hear expectations of concern or vulnerability about digital publishing. You may recall in my brief recap of the survey results that most of our respondents think they are less conservative about changing methods of publication than their colleagues, perhaps less conservative than their institutions too. This is how we're hoping all of our work comes together, uh, that the research that myself and my team are doing will inform the development of tools and services, that what we're learning about the goals of our scholars inform the deployment of our tools and services, and as the tools and services get better, the scholars get more excited about using them. Um, and that leads them to imagine new possibilities f for their work. Uh, and of course, ultimately, we hope to make the world a better place. Um, all of the work that I've presented here today are, is uh, a highly collaborative team at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Um, that is a lot of people who are also busy being administrators, students in some cases, and doing other kinds of scholarship, uh, but we all work together on this. And just before I leave today, um, I'd like to point your attention to this URL here, where we have a question by question analysis of our survey with a visual interpretation supporting each analysis. Uh, we're working up uh, an article for formal publication now, but this is freely available in our institutional repository, um, and you can work through each of the questions there if you're interested. And I do hope you find our work worth pursuing further. Thank you. Hello everyone, thanks for having me come and talk today. Um, I'm the Scholarly Communications Officer at LSE Library and my normal role is to provide a publishing advice service for staff and students and has also recently included um, this project um, that has been looking into the possibility and then the implementation of a publishing platform for the school. Um, so this is just an outline of what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'll talk about our motivations for doing the project, 
what we did and what we found out, um, some of the challenges that we met along the way, and then what's next for LSE and our uh, publishing adventures. I'll start with some background to the school and the library for anyone who doesn't know us. The London School of Economics is one of the world's leading social science universities. We've got around 2,000 researchers and they're publishing around 1,200 journal articles per year, about 100 books. Um, those are the things that we know of. And our, <laughs> sorry, and our, in addition to um, a lot of grey literature, things like reports and working papers. The LSD Library was founded in 1896 and holds over 4 million printed items. We've got extensive special collections and archives, and we've got our digital collections held in LSE Digital Library, our institutional repository, and our e-thesis repository. So why did we want to start this project? Uh, externally, the main driving force has been the HEFKE open access policy for 2021. Um, it's brought open access to the forefront of most of our conversations with our um, academics and researchers. And the REF policy has always included that some extra, ex it's included this hint that some extra credit will be given to institutions that go beyond the explicit requirements of the policy for journal articles and conference proceedings. And following consultation with institutions and funding bodies, this has been further clarified. And the next REF will include uh, a section in the research environment um, part of the REF return on open research, which allows institutions to go into detail about how their strategies are supporting open access and open data. While LSE is currently doing really well with the compliance of the HEFKE open access policy, including already going beyond the, um, the policy to include book chapters um, and making those open access where we can, um, we feel that we can always do more and we feel that the LSE should be at the forefront of any changes to and improvements to scholarly communications. Beyond REF 2021, we now know that open access monographs will be a requirement in the REF after that, REF 2027. And this is something that we and all universities need to prepare for and try to take control of some of the costs involved in this. Um, so I think we've, I hope that we've all learned from the sort of unintended consequences of the RCEK policy, which has seen some institutions paying even more to certain publishers. In a wider context, university and library presses in the UK and actually all over the world are being launched or reinvented with a focus on open access publishing and operating at much lower cost than uh, traditional publishers. These new publishing initiatives have the potential to disrupt the sc current scholarly communication environment by providing new avenues for the dissemination of research output. A report from Graham Stone and others at JISC provided findings and a rich evidence base for our own project at LSE and corroborated much of the conclusions that we had drawn up to that point. So we felt that we were on the right track with what we were doing. The JISC report closed with a number of recommendations that they are now working on implementing. And so far we've seen some community building through mailing lists and, and other meetings. Um, and a, a toolkit is forthcoming, so that will cover um, best practice, um, starting publishing workflows, and standardised publishing agreements. JISC are also preparing a dynamic purchasing system, which will assist institutions in the tendering process for publishing systems. And this will be very much welcomed as it was probably one of the hardest parts of uh, the project at LSE. And finally, the project falls within the context of the LSE 2020 strategy, which includes among its aims the, uh, the intention to continue to be recognised in leading an innovative, international, interdisciplinary and issue-oriented social science. The school is working towards the same in a number of ways, but the publishing project will contribute by attempting to disrupt scholarly communication in social science by providing a platform for open access publications and supporting non-traditional outputs. So the project started um, quite a long time ago and had sort of been brewing for a while, but in November 2016, a paper went to the school's research committee which summarised the issues around the costs of open access, um, increasing the impact of research publications, and the future of publishing more generally in terms of publishing um, uh, formats and different outputs. It also identified some opportunities for the library to lead the way in publishing innovation for the social science, 
building on the, the foundation of the publishing advice service that um, had been created with my role two years ago. The paper proposed an open access publishing platform of some kind for the school, and the committee was presented with two paths forward. We could possibly start flipping existing journals to open access, uh, in a way following the example of the Open Library of Humanities. Um, or we could create something new and innovative and um, attempt to get the academics to sort of lead the way in, in trying to describe what this might be. The board agreed that the second option was preferable and would complement the traditional publishing behaviour at LSE. And rather than trying to force a change in existing publications that in many cases just fall outside the control of LSE and its researchers, and even where, where LSE researchers do hold editorships and, and, and manage journals, it's often difficult for them to justify flipping to open access where subscription revenue uh, contributes to departments, say, in universities, or contributes to scholarship funds within the, their discipline. So we were tasked with creating something new and innovative, but uh, what does that mean? We decided to do some small piece of research to, to find out what that could mean. Um, and we decided to ask our colleagues at other libraries and new university presses. We, just, we wanted to talk to our researchers and research support staff. Um, we did a sort of internal scan of the publishing that is going on at LSE, both sort of um, publishing with external publishers, but also self-publishing, if any of that was going on. And we wanted to look at the available platforms that were out there to, that we could possibly implement to support this. Um, these steps didn't really happen in any particular order, and probably most of them all happened at the same time, um, just by um, whatever came into my desk first. So we began our investigations, as uh, I think most librarians do, by talking to colleagues at other institutions and then taking their best ideas. Um, we found a huge range of operations from one person just spending a few hours a week on supporting a journal hosting platform to um, new university presses with full teams of dedicated uh, support staff. We mainly spoke to library publishers um, who were publishing open access content um, as one of our main points of interest was the business model that they were working under and also how it was, how it was managed internally. Overall, it seemed that each publisher was slightly different, and this depended on their local resources and the subject area that they were working in. One of the most uh, common pieces of advice we received from colleagues was around managing the expectations of their authors and their editors. So as I said, we spoke to some full university presses who were doing full um, publishing process, um, and some just providing a journal platform. So managing the expectations of authors and editors is really important here, particularly if you're providing a more basic service. Uh, for example, if you're not providing copy editing services or there's a charge for that, just make that clear to the editor at the beginning of the process. And you can help them to manage um, covering those costs through um, APCs, for example, or uh, finding other sources of funding. Another good piece of advice was to start from where you want your publications to be found. So if you want your journals indexed in the directory of open access journals, then look at the requirements for being included there and then aim to meet those through your service and your platform. I was comforted to see that many library presses are, are capably run by about one FTE. Um, although as you would expect, as the press produces more publications, um, the staff requirement increases too. And this seems particularly apparent when monograph publishing comes into play. But even so, I'm aware of at least one small library press with just one member of staff offering more than just a basic service, including in-house typesetting for books and using their uh, university's design unit for book design and covers, which is very impressive. Uh, so this conversation with other library and small university presses is very much still ongoing, mainly me asking them desperate questions about what I'm doing. Um, and we've got our own sort of mailing list and we're planning uh, meetups throughout the year. I spoke to many of our researchers and this was a crucial step in the process because at LSE, if the researchers aren't happy, then no one is happy. Um, uh, and meeting with the researchers to get their thoughts on publishing 
And the possibility of the library uh, providing a publishing platform was really fascinating. I wanted to hear their stories and experiences with the publishing process, how they make their decisions, and what they think could be improved or could change in the future. One particularly encouraging story came from a philosophy academic who would like to see more open access journals in his discipline and couldn't understand why more journals weren't just flipping to open access. It just seemed so obvious to him. He works in a field of philosophy of science that crosses over with physics, so he's seen the growth and the value of the archive, the, the physics preprint server, um, and what a valuable resource it is to, to him and colleagues. As for books, he sees the academic book of the future being open. Quote, if everything is open access, then the work can speak for itself. So rather than relying on the brand of publisher, <coughs> you can just read the work. On the other side of this argument was a history researcher who had heard rumours about the open access monograph requirement in REF 2027. We met to discuss the possible consequences of this, including um, more library and university presses publishing open access monographs. But our conversation kept going back to the question of who pays and concerns that publishing an open access book with your own university or library press might look a bit like vanity publishing. So in this sense, getting the editorial and peer review processes right um, are, are crucial in, in forming a good reputation for your press. And a final story I'll mention now, uh, which was pretty unusual, um, was with an anthropology researcher who said his top priority when publishing a book it's not the publisher being a prestigious university press, but actually the quality of the paper that it's printed on. So for him, the material object of the book is just as important as the content, and he avoids otherwise very highly regarded publishers um, for this reason, because he thinks they print on poor quality paper. So we drew some conclusions from these conversations. Um, firstly, the LSE should have some kind of publishing um, operation, a press, something like that. The school has got a global reputation and would easily attract authors to publish under the LSE brand. And most people we spoke to couldn't understand why LSE didn't already have a university press or didn't have one in the, in the past. Um, we found that there was appetite from researchers to start new open access journals. And, and those ideas that we encountered during this research phase will be the first journals that we look to publish um, when we launch. There's potential for other forms of publishing to develop in the future, but our researchers weren't really sure what this would look like exactly for their own research, but they, they knew that maybe other people were doing something different and um, you know, that things would definitely change, but didn't know exactly how. And finally, we recognise that a change in culture is needed, so many of our researchers mentioned their departmental journal lists or book publisher lists, which don't give them a huge amount of choice in where they publish. So even if they started their own open access journal, um, would they be allowed to publish it or would it be on their departmental list? And where researchers were interested in the idea of data journals and data papers and more uh, unusual things like that, they doubted whether this type of publishing would contribute to the internal reward and review processes, nor would it matter to other potential employers. And if not, then was it worth the extra effort? So these were really important considerations for us as we wanted the, the publishing operation to be led by academics, with the library providing a platform and some support and guidance for getting started. So we needed to create a platform and a service that they would want to publish with, use to develop their ideas, and would champion and recommend to their colleagues. Changing the culture will be a much slower process, um, but we've, we've at least made a start on building the infrastructure and the support to help things get going. Um, so next we looked at uh, what kind of publishing is going on at LSE and there was a surprising amount that we didn't already know about. Um, we've got several student journals that operate with varying levels of support from their departments and, and, the, and the school. And um, we've already started making some efforts to support these by minting DOIs for their articles and um, adding their content to our institutional repository. The school's really keen to support student journals as part of improving the student experience. And this is related to the NSS and TEF and trying to improve um, those scores. So we're exploring this idea to find out how they could be further developed and recognised through the publishing programme. Historically, the academic journals that were owned and published by LSE have since been outsourced to commercial publishers. 
so mainly to uh, people like Wiley and Taylor and Francis. And there's no suggestion at the minute of bringing these titles back in-house, but it was useful for the project to note that the school's got a history of um, starting and sustaining high-quality journals. We also have a wealth of experience in our academics acting as publishers for their own journals, textbooks, and monograph series. Um, so, for example, we've got Anthropology of this Century, an open access journal that was started by um, an academic in the anthropology department. And then we've got this textbook, um, which is um, written by one of our philosophy um, academics, and he uses that in his undergraduate teaching. So, in answer to one of our questions, what do researchers do whenever they want to start publishing their own work? Um, they just go and do it, and they do it with whatever resources um, are available to them. So we brought all of the ideas that came out of these um, conversations with academics and other library colleagues um, to a meeting with the university's communications team to help us sort of create some conclusions or a vision. Um, and we started to formulate a vision for the LSE Press as a place for innovation and experimentation in publishing. It would be a low-risk, agile tool for trying something new, with the acceptance that if you started a journal, it might last for a year or two or go on indefinitely, and wouldn't have the assumption that ref, metrics, or ideas of prestige necessarily matter, but it would be flexible enough to support those things if they did. We discussed what academic freedom means in terms of publishing, and agreed that it should mean having the space and support to try new things. And this resulted in our guiding principles on the screen. These are very loose and vague, maybe, um, but there's room for interpretation as the service grows. Um, for example, the word innovative um, is uh, pretty open for uh, interpretation. Our first journal that we'll, we will publish is fairly traditional, aside from being open access. But for the editors, the innovation comes from the subject matter and the new interdisciplinary debate. From all of our results, we teased out some requirements for our platform. And while the focus will initially be on publishing journals, we hope that the service will grow and be able to meet future changes to scholarly communications. And I'm thinking here particularly of the future REF policy on open access monographs, but also of the influence of the TEF on uh, changes to how our students access textbooks or publish research of their own. We wanted to offer a familiar publishing environment to our editors, but with modern integrations like ORCID, the ability to comment and annotate on text, traditional and alternative metrics. We wanted to see that the platform could or would be willing to develop support for different publishing formats, like multimedia or um, code. Uh, this was a really difficult stage for us as we were trying to imagine our requirements for a service that didn't yet exist and that we wanted to be as flexible as possible. Plus, most of us on the project team had never been involved in any kind of software procurement. So the process was totally new. As I said, Disc Collections are currently working on a dynamic purchasing system and we're feeding back to them with our own experience of this uh, in the hope that it will um, benefit other institutions. In the end, Ubiquity Press met most of the requirements we had at this stage, uh, and they indicated that future developments would be based on what the community wanted. And actually, the idea of sharing ideas and best practice with an existing community of new open access publishers was a big draw for us. We see this as yet another area where libraries and universities should be working together. I'll talk briefly through some of the challenges that we met along the way. So because we were acquiring software, and even though it was hosted somewhere else, we had to make sure that we met all the requirements of our IT department. What caused a lot of difficulty was confusion over what a publishing system is. To people in, in IMT, our IT department, it seemed to be just another content management system, of which the LSE has many. Um, but of course, the platform is not just a, a display case. It manages publishing workflows and links out to production services, which our existing services uh, systems don't do. Our solution had to be hosted, which means we are somewhat limited in our choices and will continue to be limited as the service grows. There are many new and exciting publishing platforms out there, and I'm thinking here of things like Fulcrum and Manifold, and I'm hoping that in the future, institutions with the resources to do so will offer a hosting for open access, for open source platforms at a low cost. In the same way that we've seen the growth in the number of um, 
the number of options for hosting repositories or preservation systems for libraries. There could be room for developing infrastructure for hosting uh, publishing or digital scholarship platforms. Figuring out a sustainable business model for open access publishing has been extremely difficult in this project. I've got so many spreadsheets just projecting the possible combinations of what might happen over the next three to five years. And the truth is we just don't know. <laughs> um, before we announce the service to our academics, we have no idea how popular or successful it will be. And greater success means that we'll need more resource. And without some kind of sustainability model, that means cost to the school can spiral quite quickly. We think we're getting there in terms of a path or a model for sustainability, but it's likely that every publication will be slightly different, which will keep us on our toes. And speaking of being kept on our toes, I also wanted to mention the challenge of going from librarian to publisher. Last year, a workshop was held at the UKSG conference that addressed the skills of library staff in academic libraries where change is happening all the time. Up for debate was the library qualification, job descriptions, professional development, and this was all helpfully written up on a, in a blog from uh, the Cambridge's Office of Scholarly Communication. I think most librarians would agree that there's something of a skills gap for research support staff due to the ever-changing uh, nature of the role, whether that's from internal causes like increasing and varied uh, support requests from researchers, or keeping up with broader changes to scholarly communication like open research, digital scholarship, funder mandates, that sort of thing. Also last year at this conference, Kent Anderson talked about the 96 things that publishers do, and he's recently updated this to 102 things that journal publishers do. So in this context, where there might already be a skills gap for librarians, and even publishers are losing count of all the things involved on their side of things, how does a librarian turn into a publisher? For me, it's been a challenging but relatively painless process. Having worked in research support for a number of years now, I'm used to things changing and I'm used to having to look outside the library and the profession to keep myself up to date. When we first started planning and thinking about the project, I began attending workshops run by Alps to get an introduction to the publishing process. Last year I attended the annual meeting of the Society for Scholarly Publishing and just two weeks ago we had the University Press Redux all of which has given me valuable insight into the other side of academic publishing. So as well as developing many new skills, what I found is that librarians and publishers are very similar in how we work. We believe in the importance of information and of high quality research. And when faced with a change or a challenge, we all reach out to colleagues to find out what they're doing about it and look for ways to collaborate. So in this sense, although the task can be daunting at times, I'm fully confident in the success of the LSE Press, both despite and because of its library origins. So what's next? I think we'll be continually learning about becoming publishers and we'll need all the help we can get from colleagues um, at other institutions. Um, we'll be starting to make some noise about the project um, within LSE and beyond. And we hope to draw out our own academics with um, great ideas for open access journals and and other new publications. I'm currently working with our first editors and the journal that will launch with us. Um, hopefully we're looking at launching within the next couple of months, um, if everything goes as planned. Um, so please look out for us, spread the word, um, give us any feedback that you might have, and thank you for listening. Great, thank you both for those excellent presentations. I mean, it's always a delight to see uh, both kind of uh, research into what people need and want and, uh, and also the practical steps of getting, uh, getting involved in that. I'm um, speaking of the importance of research, just before, while you're thinking of questions to ask the panel, um, don't forget your survey sheet in your pack, nice yellow sheet, uh, while you're minded to the notion of the importance of uh, academics being able to do their research, then this is a good time to remember to fill that in. Um, okay, good. We've got a nice bit of time for questions, and I'm sure that there's plenty of people in the audience who will have questions. I see one or two already. Um, there's people in the audience of, with microphones uh, to hand out, so uh, we'll start with uh, Anthony there. Anthony Watkinson, uh, Cyber Research. Um, this is about monographs primarily. 
and it's about humanities monographs, obviously. And it's a question for both of you, but particularly for Maria, who will recognize some of the stuff I'm going to quickly ask about. Um, Maria will know that there was a survey done, I think one in Michigan and one in Indiana, of the, where these researchers in humanities wanted to publish. And it came up with, I think, the Michigan one, Oxford University Press, Cambridge University Press, Routledge, Palgrave, and then other university presses. And then, I think, I don't know where Michigan was, but it wasn't at the top four or five. Um, why are these people, researchers, wanting to publish in these large companies outside their own press, which they cherish so much? I mean, they do cherish them. There you go. Easy question to start with. Uh, the, the sense I, we haven't asked that question specifically, but the sense that I get is um, prestige. Um, and a sense of the reputational effect within the institution, uh, particularly for the junior scholars, scholars that are making their promotion and tenure cases. Uh, the, the excitement I hear from uh, the scholars that in the past would probably have, uh, first recourse would have been a print monograph publication tends to be about the, um, the rep representational possibilities of the web and digital publishing. Uh, and I'll, I'll just say that one of the ways we're trying to address this in our own initiative, we haven't reached out to commercial publishers, but is to provide what we call a, a pipeline to university presses. Uh, so in our early stages of development and publishing without walls, we reached out to a number of university presses who have expressed interest and in some um, ways have developed capacity for digital publishing, but don't feel they have quite the same room for the risk of experimental uh, publishing. And they said, so what if we come up with a great project that's a great fit with your list, but the author's first and primary goal is to have a digital representation for it to be open access? Can we broker a conversation about there also being um, a, a print and ebook uh, monograph coming out under your imprint. Uh, and we had four university presses that said, sure. Uh, and so we're working that, that through now. We have publications in digital development where we're just starting to try to figure out the workflow and the pass, passing it on uh, so as to allow um, scholars to take advantage of, of both of those things. Uh, so that's the way we're addressing the issue. But my short answer, I think, is pr prestige and reputation. Yeah. I suppose I can add something from um, my experience as, uh, in running the publishing advice service at LSE. Um, I mainly deal with um, PhD or um, people who've just gained their PhD, and they're, they're looking at publishing a book for the first time. Um, and their main consideration is, um, where do people publish in their department? But also they're looking at um, where might it be best to get published in terms of speed? And so places like Routledge and Palgrave seem to have a better reputation for sort of, the, I mean, churning isn't a great word, but getting through things quite quickly. Um, but also they're looking at the price of um, how much it's gonna cost to buy the end product. And also, how easy is it to find out how you, how you submit something? So I think Routledge have got a really easy form to fill in. Um, so for, for first-timers, that's, um, that's probably a big consideration. Can they find the information easily on the, on the internet? And how easy is it to write the proposal without having done one before? OK, great, thank you. Uh, another question from somewhere? Don't be shy now, otherwise I'll have to start asking questions. Yeah, well, no, uh, let's, let's give somebody else a chance, Anthony, just for a moment. Let's, let's just hold on. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm just going to ask a question that's on my mind, which you talked a little bit about the skills gap issue. And, I'm, and it turned me to wondering whether library publishing is an opportunity for publishers to go and work in libraries, or whether it's an opportunity for librarians to retrain as publishers. And, I mean, I guess both are true, but, I mean, do you both have thoughts on on that, that in terms of career development? Um, uh, I think a bit of that already happens. 
And somebody at the UKSG, I think it was the one day conference or the UKSG forum last year, a publisher actually came up with the idea of sort of swapping roles for a day, which was really interesting. Um, but I'm not sure if that ever happened. <laughs> um, but yeah, certainly there's room for a crossover. I mean, um, I don't see why not. There's a certain, there's a skills gap, but there's also an overlap in the skills, I think. Okay. I have taught a course at my school called uh, Publishing as an Information Profession. And the students in my program are primarily intending to become librarians. Um, it is, it's one of the foremost uh, schools of library science in the United States. Uh, and I have a hard time filling it. Uh, there's a handful that come floating in wanting to publish young adult fiction. And if I suggest that's not the primary focus of the class, um, they, they leave. Um, and then a, a handful of enthusiasts that come in. Uh, but what's interesting to me is when I sort of announced in my scholarly publishing world that I was going to teach this, uh, the number of um, emails that I got almost immediately from librarians saying, put it online, please. Uh, these were working librarians who had come to a recognition that they needed to, to tool up in this area. Uh, I haven't put it online yet. Uh, but then I also wonder if people are aware of the work that the Library Publishing Coalition has been doing in the US. Uh, to design training materials, open, open training materials uh, for librarians. I'm actually field testing some of those with, I, I'm teaching a class now called Issues in Scholarly Communication, uh, but they're trying to get up to a point of releasing those more publicly so that if librarians, you know, who are in the field doing their work and suddenly you say like, I don't know, what does the editorial process look like? Or how do you develop a policy? that they can go and they can find some resources uh, to, um, to, to gain those skills, or at least some familiarity with them. Okay, great, thank you. Right, so someone in the audience. Uh, somebody right at the back, uh, Roger, Robert. Hi there, it's Robert Harrington. Actually, I know I don't sound like it, but an American mathematical society. Um, this is more for Lucy, perhaps. The, when you're thinking about creating what is essentially a, a more locally based publishing operation for LSE, how do you think, can you think about some of the things that Alison was talking about in the keynote earlier for the need to be more global in a sort of diversity, from a diversity point of view? Science needs to move to be more global and publishing needs to do that too. So how does that square with creating a, a more locally based publishing operation? Um, that's a good point. Um, I hope that they sort of complement the two. So we're, we decided not to go down that route of taking over journals and flipping them. Um, we decided to do something that would complement the existing system that's going on and to provide some, somewhere for our, where our academics can try something new um, where they maybe haven't been able to do that before. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. I'm not sure there is an answer to the question. Right? <laughs> no, I'm not sure there is an answer to the question. No. It, isn't it also true that uh, our scholars are intensely gl global, even if they're local? Um, yeah, I mean, it's one of the most global institutions. Um, uh, in, in, in my past, I, I ran Michigan Publishing, and we reached out first to our faculty in order to start building the enterprise. But with them, they brought a whole host of global partners. And so. The primary point of contact was still local, but you can g get global pretty quickly, I think. Okay, thank you. And Robert, you know, despite what you say, you did sound quite mathematical back there. I don't know. So. Uh, right, next question. Uh, yes. I was interested. And you could uh, yes. say who you, who yes. you are, if that, if Anna you could. Anna Sharman, co-factor with a training consultancy company. Um, I was interested in the survey result, I think it was Lucy saying that um, authors want to set up their own journals. And I'm kind of interested in, I, mean, I don't know if you found out why that was. There is an argument that there are already quite a lot of journals and do we really need any more? <laughs> um, yeah, um, so we've had a few. And I mean, the one that we're launching with is qu quite traditional, which I think is good for us because we're just learning about how to do it all. Um, but the other sort of ideas that we picked up and, and proposals are 
actually more um, uh, slightly more experimental. So we've got one idea for a journal of code, um, which in the social sciences I guess is quite new. Um, and then another um, idea for a social science mega journal with open peer review and you know all of these new things that we're talking about in open science, which is really exciting. And I'm not really sure how how we're going to do that, but <laughs> um, that, that's the whole point of the project is to find out what the ideas are, how can we make them happen, um, and are they sort of viable. Okay, um, right, another question, just right on the front there. Uh, Matt Day from Cambridge University Press. So uh, <clears throat> I think it's fantastic that the more people who are involved, interested in publishing and taking it seriously and having a go, it, it, it's just better for the whole publishing enterprise. Um, but I'm curious about whether you feel, I mean, this is perhaps both for uh, Lucy, but for both of you, whether you feel that you're, through your interests in it, you're essentially coming up with the same problems that publishers have already solved and you're just either coming up with new ways to solve them or coming up with the same solutions or whether you feel that you really are finding new ways to do things or ways to do new things. Do you really feel that you're doing things differently? Um, I'm, I'm not sure, and uh, we won't know until we start doing it. Um, finding new ways to solve old problems is probably not a bad thing in itself. I think that's a good, that would be a good outcome if we, if we got to that point. Um, if we don't solve any problems, that might... <laughs> that might mean we're on the wrong track, but um, um, yes, I, I, I hope that there's room for us in the um, sort of scholarly publishing ecosystem, um, and I think you're right, I think the more people the better, the more brains the better. I'm perhaps interested in the problems that haven't been solved yet. <laughs> if we could come up with new ways to solve old problems, that's great. But I think there's still a lot of problems to be solved the first time. Uh, so uh, do those. And I think also that um, li libraries are still at risk in investing in publishing. Uh, but despite my respondent who said universities don't have a good tolerance for failure, um, I think that there is a little bit more room in this space for um, for innovation without extreme vulnerability. Um, if we don't demonstrate a return on that investment, our institutions will have some questions. Uh, but because uh, libraries in particular are very much um, engaged with the question of how to remain relevant to their campuses, I think they have an opportunity to say, Okay, give us a try. Let's see what problems we can solve. Okay, I think we've got time for one more question. Somebody, um, there's somebody just uh, halfway there. Um, hi, Gav Cole from Loughborough University. It's a question for Maria, if I may. Um, on one of your slides from the survey results said that digital archive and digital preservation were seen as important to researchers. I was just wondering, I appreciate it's difficult from a survey, but from the interviews, whether you'd been able to tease out whether all researchers meant the same thing by digital archive and digital preservation, and if so, what they meant by that. I would say no, they don't all mean the same thing, uh, but you know, the ranges of things I've heard are from I want the links to continue to work, uh, to knowing that there is um, a safe place that's a reductive, but it's a safe place for storage. Um, and a lot of, uh, I mean, libraries, I think, get a lot of mileage out of their reputation for preservation. Uh, and that the um, interview subjects say, I like the idea of working with the library on this because I know the library will pay attention. Uh, to, to preservation because it's what they do. The, um, and I hope that's not an overestimation of libraries. I know it's what we try to do. Um, but I think, I, I, again, and this is an anecdotal sense uh, from the scholars, that what it will take to maintain and preserve digital project products is so mysterious to them that they really want somebody who will be thinking about it for them. Like, I want to know that this isn't my problem. In fact, we sometimes make it their problem because in the consultation phase, we say, look at your metadata. 
oh, this is going to need some work. You're going to have to get engaged with that. Uh, but they're at least led to that question through, through the conversation with the librarians. I don't know if that answers your question. Great, thank you. Um, all right, I think uh, it's probably time now to move on to the next thing. So would you just join me in a round of applause for our two great speakers? Um, so we're now going to move to uh, lunch. You'll be thrilled to know. Uh, lunch uh, today is sponsored by Silverchair, so thank you for that. Um, uh, the, if you have dietary con concerns or requirements, uh, the food should be labelled uh, with any kind of allergens or concerns that you might have. Um, or if you've been spoken to personally, there might be a special plate set aside for you. Uh, so uh, we'll see you back here in, um, I think it's... Uh, 50 minutes, so thank you very much. Mm -hmm.